So it's 3.30, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the Governance and Operations meeting of February 27th, 2023. Um, just so that the, the public are aware that they can um, join us in person now and also via Zoom. Uh, they just have to go to the uh, City of Trail website and get the link and you can join us via um, social media on the YouTube site. So today we have uh, two delegations with us. And the first delegation up is the Lower Columbia Initiatives Corporation um, to share their 2023 first quarter report with us. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Rebecca Richards, the director of LCIC, and this is Yakmeen Van Tonder. She's the director of Metal Tech Alley at the LCIC. Uh, so you can skip ahead to the next slide and the one after that, actually, because I just introduced us. Okay, uh, so Yakmeen is going to give you an update on the latest for Metal Tech Alley, and then I'll do my update afterwards. So I've, I've written a lot of stuff on there that you can all read, uh, but I have a few highlights that I just want to mention. Um, one of them is that our member of parliament, Richard Cannings, came to visit us uh, Wednesday uh, on invitation from us because of our battery hub project. And we took him on a tour uh, at Tech and Casey Recycling and Retrieve. And um, Bev was part of the tour at Tech. Thank you for doing You're that, Bev. We appreciate that. Um, so what... What we discussed with him is going to be my next point, and that's the project that we are busy with, the battery hub. Um, and it ended us with him inviting me to come to Ottawa in June when I, um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to Toronto for a conference. So we said, Parliament is sitting, you should come and I'll arrange a meeting with Minister Jonathan Wilkinson so that we can bring this to his attention. They need to know about this. So I think it was a very successful day and it was a very exciting day. I was my first time for a tour at Tech and I was so excited and it was so great. Um, so the other thing that I just want to mention is that I was um, nominated for the top 10 thought leaders of the year for Kootenai Business Magazine for last year. And there were only three people of the West Kootenays on the top 10 list, and I was uh, one of them. And it's because of Metal Tech Alley. If it wasn't for Metal Tech Alley, I would never have been on there. So thanks for giving me the opportunity <laughs> to do that. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Oh, where is our graphic? One back, maybe? Should be the flow chart. Oh. Yes, that's... The battery hub? Oh, yes. Weird. Okay. It's missing. Oh, it's there it is. Okay. Oh, that's the one. That's the one I'm looking for. So this is the big project that we're working on. Um, this is our project for this year. We started in January and it will run till the end of um the end of this year, December. Uh it's a feasibility study. So what happened is I've I'm part of the Battery Metals Association of Canada. And they've indicated in all their workshops that I attended last year that there needs to be a battery hub in Western Canada and in Eastern Canada. And I immediately jumped on it and said, Western Canada should be here because we have so many components of a battery hub here already. Um, and it, it all comes back to Rebecca and I sitting, you know, what is the sustainability of the area? Um, we know tech is going to be here for many years, but what are we doing apart from that? And how can we use that? So this came to mind and we got funding from the province to do this feasibility study. We have consultants from Vancouver that's working on it. And so far it's going really well. And this is why we got um, Richard Cannings here is because of this. And this is what they want to know. How are we? And I told them we're busy with the feasibility study. I know it can be done. I just need the document to tell me it can be done. And, and he said, well, you should come now. So I will um, do that with great pleasure. I love talking about stuff like this. Um, so hopefully it can, it, something can come out of it. I always say to Rebecca, you never know. You never know whom you talk to. You have to take everything seriously. 
So, um, yo, that's uh, what's keeping me busy nowadays. When are you planning to meet with uh, Richard? I'm going to... Um, I think you're in... In 13, 14 June, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, so I will be at the conference in Toronto the Monday and Tuesday, and then probably traveling to Ottawa on the Wednesday, meet either Wednesday or Thursday, and then come back on Friday. It's exciting. It's very yeah. exciting. I got a um an email out of the blue the other day from somebody from Natural Resources Canada. And he was introducing me to a person from the province, his counterpart in the province. And his comment to me was, Oh, everybody knows here yeah, around here knows what Metal Take Alley is. Um, that's why he wanted to introduce me to the province, but I knew that guy already. Um, but you know, it's it's we the word is out there and it's it's gonna come. <laughs> What's the potential for employment? Uh, very high because these are big industries that we want to bring in. Mm -hmm. um, it, it works well with Rebecca's plan with the lands um, inventory that she did because we know what's available for that. But if you look at, at what's going to come out of this or what we hope is going to come out of this, uh, first of all, it will have bigger industry, not as big as tech, but bigger industry. And with that, you get all these subsets from that. All the support services from that will also come. So I don't know, and I will probably know by the end of the, with the feasibility study, that's one of the things that I've asked of them to give me, you know, a projection on that. So I'll probably have more answers by the end of the feasibility study, but the idea is lots. <laughs> Sounds good, thank you. Who came up with the Metal Tech Alley handle? Um, in 2016, <laughs> we did a foreign direct investment strategy plan with funding from the government, from the federal government. And we got a, um, a consultant in from Calgary, and she wrote out the whole plan and the whole thing. Yeah, I think there was a bit of a workshop around the name. Yeah. But, I mean, it was before my time with yeah, the OCIC. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's a good name. Yeah. 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 I think I think we need to um, make sure that Terry is um, credited with with a bunch of that. Oh, she did so much work. Yeah, she like yes, yeah, she she liked mm -hmm. all the groundwork for this, and she's actually now working at Geyser Recycling. So I see her often, and then we all get so excited about where all of this is. Okay. All right, I'll take over. Um, and I just want to say that, like, to next question about the. Um, employment this battery hub is important not only from the investment attraction and bringing in new businesses sort of standpoint but also the business retention so uh, you may be aware that kc recycling and retrieve which is actually now service solutions are owned by american business interests so we need to be working to make sure that they stay here. So KC Recycling has expansion plans and it's looking good for them, but Service Solutions is a little bit more of a mystery to us. It's very new. They were just bought out Retrieve. Um, and we really want to make sure that those jobs, which I think it's about 60, 70 jobs. At... 75 at KC and there's just over 100 between the two of them. Okay, yeah. So, you know, like we want to keep those jobs here. So part of the battery hub is strengthening the economy that we already have in the battery sector. Okay, you can go on to the next slide and I will tell you a little bit about what the LCIC is up to. Um, and I just want to say how exciting it is to be here in person with you guys. It's a new council and it's our first time uh, presenting in person because like we started in the middle yeah. of the pandemic. So. Yeah. Oh, and so thanks cool. for everybody that attended the CED presentation last week. Thank you. It was good. Yeah, well, thank thank you. you. All right. Um, so I'm not going to go through absolutely everything on my list here, but just a couple of key updates. So the land... Um, a commercial and industrial land inventory. So we did that last year, and now there is a GIS integration that's available on the web at map.metaltechalley.com. So you can go and check out all the different parcels and their different attributes. Uh, we're also going to be creating an internal 
uh, more detailed map because we collected quite a bit of information that's not for public viewing. So, but that'll be used by us in house. So when investors come to call in the area, we have all that information at our fingertips, which is very exciting. Um, and it's also all in a database. And I'm really happy that this tool can be a, a long lived one. So it just needs to be updated every couple of years, bring in a summer student to do some data collection research experience work. And then we have an up to date tool all the time. So that's really nice. Um, and then building on that this year, I've contracted with Rinnick, which is a consulting firm that's had quite a bit of experience in the Kootenays. They worked in Canal Flats, in Fruitvale, and in Castlegar, so they know the general area quite well, and they'll be doing the land development strategy. So I've emailed out to um, the municipalities and various industries to introduce them, and we're looking to see what can be reasonably done with the available industrial and commercial land and make sure that it's in line with community expectations for development. We don't want to be, you know, setting up a battery recycling plant in Roslyn. That's not really with the ski town chic. So we just want to make sure that what we do is reflected in what you guys are looking for with that. Um, we're also embarking on a connectivity um, infrastructure study and improvements plan. So again, that will be done in partnership with the communities. And that's focused on what can we do about improving connectivity within our communities, uh, recognizing that it's difficult in a rural area, it's expensive when you have a sparsely populated area to put in new infrastructure. So what's the capacity of what we've already got and where can we reasonably make improvements is kind of our goal with that. And then um, an update on the Juanita Crossing. Just in the last couple of months, there's been some interesting developments. So you know that we are slowly working towards some solid advocacy around getting a low elevation crossing established here. This is a big project. It's a dream. It's 10 year vision. If you talk to Dan Ashman, it's a 25 year vision <laughs> with what he wants to achieve. Yeah, but that is there. Yeah. Your focus. <laughs> yeah. So um, we will be hopefully proceeding with a study uh, to kind of collect evidence for the case about why it would be good to have a low elevation crossing. We all know, we live here, we experience the reality, but we are going to be talking to folks in Ottawa who have no idea what it's like here. So we need to build the case. Um, so I'm looking for a bit of funding on that right now, but SCBC has indicated interest in the project. Um, so that might be a source of funding. And then Richard said we should give him a business guys on that. That's never ever happened. Yeah, we were quite surprised by that. Yeah. Um, and then I also had a conversation with the new port manager for Frontier and Boundary, so the American ports. And he's quite interested in improving the commercial rail um, transactions through the border. So that seems like a good starting point. And he's also suggested setting up a trade group for businesses on this side and businesses on the US side that have interests in the border crossings here. So we're quite excited by that. That's the first time we've gotten engagement um, with the American side of this. And I've also reached out to my counterparts in the Tri-County area. So that's the economic development group down there. And they're also interested in seeing improvements to the border crossing. They were very unhappy when the US Customs Department apparently decided to reduce their hours at the border crossing. And that was quite upsetting to that area. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with them more this year as well. So I'm gonna leave it at that and just okay. turn it over to Moreg. And she'll do kind of an LCC introduction. Do you want our... do you have your... I do not have a slide. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, so um, there is a so the, the LCC DTS is the parent body for the LCIC. And when you fund the LCIC, the LCC DTS, um, the funding flows through the LCC DTS to the LCIC. Um, and we keep a small portion of that funding. And the work that we 
that we do with that, which is about 6%, a little bit over 6% of the funding, um, supports a lot of the community development work. So the way that the LCC DTS um, is operated, it has a, there's a small executive committee and then there is a larger members meeting. And the executive committee is me, uh, Jan Morton, who is the a past president of the LCC DTS, but also the president of the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Committee, Bill Van Beek, who is the treasurer and was another is another past president of the LCC DTS, and uh, Frank Moreno, who was um, who, who is a director and leader of the Community Health Center um, uh, piece of this, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, and um, you know we're working, you know we're not looking for him to resign as mayor so that he can stay on, but we are going to figure out uh, his role. His, his role. Um, so uh, and at the monthly the monthly members meeting um, is on the third Thursday of the month, and uh, Colin actually came to talk to us last month about the um about the last council meeting where there was a decision around the um um around the the shelter all right so do you want to go to the next slide please staring far far away down here there we go all right perfect so um i just i'm just going to talk to you about a few of the uh little bits of work that we've got going on at the moment so the centerpiece for the lcc dts is actually the Trail Incredible Farmers Market, which I know you're going to be hearing from Gina in a second, and I don't want to steal her thunder, but I will talk about her because she won't talk about herself. So Gina is um, Gina has been the driving force behind the success of the market, and so it started in 2015 as a small market and is now uh, on the verge of becoming one of the largest community markets in BC, employing directly 133 people on farms um, and, um, and also using, uh, this is excluding her own volunteer hours, I'm assuming, because uh, this, it doesn't seem right um, uh, with her hours in it. So an annually 5,000, over 5,000 volunteer hours, which is, as you all know, it's a two and a half, full-time, full-year positions, which Gina has costed out at minimum wage. I'm not even going to give that number because it's it's so low. Um, but, but this is an enormous operation that she has um, that brings community together in all sorts of really amazing ways and has helped us, for example, um, uh, share lots of the equity, diversity and inclusion work that we have all been doing, comes together in the market. Lots of the work that we do around poverty reduction comes together in the market. It's absolutely amazing work that they are doing there. And um, one of the things that she might also tell you, if she is prompted, um, that uh, at the special events that the, that the market also hosts, which is the, the Christmas markets and the Easter markets, which have been held at the mall, um, the regular vendors, the regular storekeepers in the, market, in, the, in the mall, and even downtown, when the market happens downtown, see that their transactions double on the days when that market happens. And I'm sure you've all been there and mm -hmm. tried to get parking. <laughs> More I've that oh seven times. <laughs> times. I, was, I was there at 8.30 last time <laughs> to make sure that I got parking to get into the market. It was amazing. It's, um, it's, uh, it's an incredible event and, an, and, a, and a wonderful contribution to community. So that all comes from the funding that you support through the LCC DTS. Um, the Health and Hospital uh, Committee is working on a, um, a community health centre. There's nothing very much to update on that because they're they're waiting for the province to get back to them. So I'll I'll be able to probably talk to you a little bit more than that in Q2 and Q3 this year. The Sustainability Committee, um, uh, which has hosted events in the past, for example, we hosted the first sustainability show which was in the fall of 2019, which, you know, we were going to have every year, but then COVID, um, uh, has also hosted speakers like David Suzuki. So that was the, you know, that was an event for, for here that came from that. Um, and this year we will be hosting the next trade show, which we're actually calling the Modern Living Show. It's happening in the first weekend of May, which is the 6th and 7th of May. 
at the Juanita Mall. Make sure that you get there early to find your parking. <laughs> um, Can we arrange a reserve for <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, With me and my hybrid, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there is uh, the expectation that there'll be lots of speakers, people, um, uh, there'll be a lot of um, Gina's, because Gina is also helping to organise this, a lot of Gina's farmers will also be there. Um, but we're actually targeting people with businesses that are um, that are, are working in the sector that will help us with our greenhouse gas reduction numbers and our sustainability updates and our building renovations. I'll talk to you more about that two weeks from now. Um, so, so there's lots of, of work going into that um, and, and building that up. And then um, finally, um, because we know that there is a huge amount of pressure on um, money, and we're all feeling it, all of us who run businesses are all feeling that, um, we just wanted to make sure that you knew that we were actually working together to make sure that there is, um, you know, that we're that we're very clear about where money goes. Um, and so we're working to streamline our operations to make the most of the money that comes in. And then just the final slide is um, housing. So, um, uh, so um, so again, I mean, this, these are big projects. So there's, there's very little difference between one quarter and another, um, but we're working, Jan and her team, are working incredibly hard through the Attainable Housing Committee to make sure that there is affordable housing going in. The Roslyn Yards um, is the latest of these two open, and that will be probably in the spring this year. I think that they're talking about May this year as being occupation dates. Um, but she continues to work with Fruitvale. Um, I forgot to talk about the Fruitvale market, but Gina will. Um, but, but to develop the affordable um, uh, housing um, options for there. And one of the things that um, the Table Housing Committee is going to be working on with Rebecca uh, in the next year or so is to think about the market housing situation here as well, because we all know that that needs quite a bit of work as well. So that is what is going on uh, in terms of the housing strategy in town as well. I don't know whether you've got any questions at all about any of this. I actually have a quick question. Sure. Um, can you explain the difference between attainable housing and affordable housing? Um, so the attainable housing committee for the LCC DTS was always meant to look at the full range of housing okay. options. So supportive housing, um, market housing, and affordable housing. Okay. Um, so that's I mean that's so it's the, the attainable housing thing is an umbrella um, term for the full range of housing options. Thank you. So the ones that you have listed here is all the attainable housing that we've been able to uh, attain so far. This is affordable housing that we have that has been built so far, and um, with the exception of the Bains um, or Bins lot. Um, uh, most of that housing has been built within the period that I've been in trail, which is only five years, right? So this is, there was a, it was a huge hole in the market and um, the Lower Columbia Affordable Housing Society have actually waited in there working closely with DC Housing to actually develop these, um, these projects. So they've done absolutely amazing work and that work happened because of the investment that you make in the RCC DTS. So that's that's how it started. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Question. So is there plans for this sort of housing in trail? I, I might have missed that. So, so there are two affordable housing um, uh, pieces in trail. Okay. The first one is beside um, the optometrist um, on, I want to say McCoy. 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 By Safeway? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. So that's a fourplex. Oh. Yeah, that's that's a fourplex. Right. Yeah. And then there are 10 units on Columbia Avenue, which was opened, I want to say 2021. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Um, so that so was that. And then there is I think I, I <clears throat> might say actually on this slide how many units there are in at Roslyn Yards, but it's too far away for my aged eyes to be able to see it. Right. I think it's like 30 or something. Yeah. I mean, 30 it's, yeah, it's about, it's, yeah, I think it's over 30. Yeah. 
And then there is a whole new development that's going into Prukhan, but I don't know exactly how many units that is. Yeah. Yeah. 31. 31 units. In Prukhan, yeah. yeah. Just seems like trail's not mentioned on there. It's, be it's because the, the the units in trail are already there. They oh, were so first in line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's there's, four, there's been fourteen new units in trail. Fourteen, and then Fruitvale's looking again thirty one. Yeah. Um, so that's going on the old school. Um, that's cool. On the old oh, school nice. Uh, nice. side there. Yeah, and just um, to add to what Mari said, so the. The LCIC, I'm going to be involved in this uh, sort of strictly on the market housing. So that's my concept working with the Attainable Housing Committee, as well as hopefully the Chamber and Community Futures. I want to find a way that we can be supportive to communities in attracting developers and um, bringing some regular market housing, whatever that looks like, townhouses, apartments, single family dwellings all of those options just to increase the housing supply more generally. Yeah. Just to follow that up, uh, which community futures is that? Because I know there's... Uh, community futures greater trail yeah, is a main partner. And yeah. chambers of commerce? In trail, yes. Intra. Okay. So it's early days on this project, but hopefully yeah. the aim, I'm starting now so that hopefully we have something going in 2024 is my aim. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Any other Thank questions? You. No? Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to our next delegation, please. And that would be the LCC BTS Sustainable Agriculture Committee, the Trails Incredible Farmers Market. Uh, I'd be excused. <laughs> or you can stay if you like. <laughs> So hello, my name is uh, Gina Ironmonger from the Sustainable Local Agriculture Committee and Trails Incredible Farmers Market. And I must be feeling positive because I paid for our business license today. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh good, the slides are there. Thank you very much. I, I don't know who's pushing them forward, but anyway, so first off, thank you very kindly for uh, providing us the opportunity to present to you um, information about or the details about Trails Incredible Farmers Market, how we started, how we've grown and the impact on the market to agriculture, the community and uh, businesses and the issues that we're facing due to unbelievable growth and the support that we need and possible solutions. So basically we started in 2015 with 10 to 15 local make bake grow vendors right on Cedar Avenue. It was a small little market. And at, at that time, we had absolutely no idea that the passion of our volunteers uh, to promote and support local agriculture would uh, grow this market the way it has. You know, our, our purpose was to facilitate and advocate for food growing strategies, because I don't know if many of you remember at that time, you know, nobody thought we could grow food here. So anyways, and so it was really embraced by our communities. This market is all volunteer run. It's an award-winning market um, that received the provincial award for the best market in BC and has received uh, two awards from the Trail District Chamber of Commerce, one being the Community Impact Award and one for nonprofits. And I'm hoping that as we, as we work through the social and economic impact of the farmer's market, it will be easy to understand why the provincial government recognizes um, and has designated uh, farmer's markets as an essential service. Next one is who we are. Next slide. Oh, I got that. Okay, where we are now, I'm a little mixed up. <laughs> So next slide is where we are now. Yeah, yeah, okay. So basically this is where we are now. And as we started with 10 to 15 vendors, last year in 23, we had 188 local make, bake, grow rotating vendors with over 40,000 visitors. And, um, and of course, support to nonprofits and other community organizations. Um, 
in 2021, we had 127 rotating vendors and 27,000 visitors. So you can see the growth between the two years and where we started from with 10 to 15 vendors. So, you know, it's all volunteers. But anyway, so next slide is about our partnerships and collaborations. You know, we reach out and we work with other organizations to strengthen and share the workload with other events. And you can probably probably know that part of that is Spooktacular. We do the market at Spooktacular. Um, the Trail and District Arts Council, Trail and District Public Library does a, a food um, program for us uh, for children 12 and under. Um, and we collaborate together with that one. Um, we have a Kootenai Teen Chef Club with the um, Trail and District Chamber of Commerce. That's an amazing program. But I should also add that that 40,000 visitor count, it does not include Music in the Park Night Market, which is a very popular event and spectacular. And I haven't included those because I have no way of knowing the numbers. At our market, we, can, we actually count people as they come through the gates. But this is really a fun family event. And it's a market that promotes diversity, but not only through our celebrations, because we also do pride with the city of Trail, but in our volunteer base. And um, so we support young families with programs, as you can see, with different health, healthy eating, et cetera. The next page is a uh, social impact. And here is the uh, farmer. We'll talk here about the impact of the Farmer's Market Nutrition Coupon Program. Uh, to our community. And I'll let Mary Lynn, because our partner with that is the Trail United Church Food Bank. And so I'll let Mary Lynn talk a little bit about that. So I'm not sure I did leave presentations. I don't know if Sandy did them to you. So um, I, um, Gina reeled me in eight years ago to uh, to partner with the, uh, for the coupon program. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and um, and deliver the BC Farmers Market Coupon Program. Um, there are many benefits with that. And you can see by the numbers that we, um, I have more people signed up than I have coupons. So usually I go and find some more money to <laughs> buy some more coupons, which I've done. Um, but um, the other thing that I found interesting when I was doing the stats, because I keep track of where we come from too. And last year was the first year I said, where do you live? because people are always asking me. Well, I had 11 people signed up for Fruitvale. I had four people signed up for Rosalind. I also have Warfield and Trail and Janelle. And what I'm finding is our, our return rate is absolutely phenomenal in the amount of people that bring their coupons in. And what I'm finding is that the people from outside our region are saying, oh, you guys have one of the best markets and come down, whether it be Rosalind Trail, whatever. Um, and the people that come to the market are the ones that are having trouble struggling. They're struggling to buy groceries, they're struggling. And to me, I see this as a real win-win for the farmers and the people that get the coupon program. Um, one of the other benefits that happens with the food bank is the farmers then give me extra produce when they have extra produce so that I can share it with the, nice. the people that, that do the food bank. And that, that's been a real win-win too. Um, so I'm not going to repeat what I have if you have any questions, but the one thing is that it, it is very beneficial for the people that are low income, the people that come from Jubilee Manor. There's a, a number of people that are really struggling. And this last year, they upped it to $27 and honey before you couldn't get honey. Um, you know, but even us, we started small and it keeps growing and people ask for more. Yeah. Thank you, Meredith. And so basically that market, the market uh, supports over 300 financially challenged seniors, expectant moms and families. That's a huge impact on our, on our region. So the next slide will also continue with the economic impact. And I think that this is kind of really kind of phenomenal. So these stats that are on this page here are for farmland only. And three farms didn't um, report, so they're not included in these stats. 
So the farm, these farm vendors represent 1,202 acres in agricultural production, and that adds to our food security and sustainability. And that number continues to increase. And I know that because I've been getting calls for from farmers for this year. So new farmers. But what I find quite intriguing is the number of employees um, that these farmed acres employ, and that's 133. And now this is only the farm vendors. So if you consider that we have close to 200 um, make eight grow vendors, you know, you could easily and conservative, conservatively add on another 200 employees, full and part time. But also, some of our non farm vendors, they're low income. And so the markets also help supplement their household income. Um, so, with, with, and I think in consideration of the current economic climate, that might become more and more important. But before we leave this slide, I'd just like to point out the additional impacts because many of these part time employees, they want to learn how to grow their own food. Or their, to grow in their own backyard. So many of them are working there or some volunteer. This doesn't include volunteers. I think it does. It just includes, no, it doesn't. So, and then um, the uh, farmers also give workshops uh, on and off the farm, webinars, etc. cetera. Uh, some of them you probably might've been to courses at, at Selkirk College with them. So. You know, and now many of these vendors are selling in grocery stores, liquor stores, restaurants, and other outlets. So it's just that circular economy just keeps kind of growing and growing. And hopefully, when you're at a local restaurant, you might buy a local wine or whatever. But anyways, the next slide is also continues with economic impact. Yeah, the one with the beat. Hmm. The one right before that. There we go. So what this market provides really is a low cost entry to test the market for vendors to build a clientele and thus expand and extend their growing seasons and thereby increase their selling options. So, you know, now I see like lots of them, they're collaborating with each other um, on home delivery baskets. You know, many now have online presence, whereas before they didn't, where clients can order and pick up. They're, they've grown that much. They can pick up at the market. Um, we have a support pr program, Hatch and Hype. It's an entrepreneurial program that promotes new products and new vendors and supports uh, vendors that way. A food recovery program we have that is um, basically, Marianne mentioned that a little bit about unsold um, product at the end of the market goes, much of it goes to the food, food bank and for redistribution or to be preserved. But there's also another um, important factor, and I think that can't be overlooked, that the market is really in a position to easily to recognize um, other things that need to be implemented. So that chicken and the egg thing. So, you know, it's, um, for example, we recognized last year that many of our food producers are, were ready to move from their low risk to higher risk uh, food uh, production, or they couldn't keep up with demand in their little kitchen. So we needed a, we need, desperately need a commercial kitchen for that end. Um, we need an incubator kitchen. And hopefully, you know, hopefully that will set them off to their own business. And I can, if you can see, you can see how that circular economy would even work better because now they'll be able to have that commercial aspect where now they can sell maybe specialized desserts or whatever to restaurants, those types of things. So there's always some, you know, and there's always something, I think something else basically is, you know, that studies indicate that 70% of um, shoppers visit a storefront on their way or from the market. And, um, you know, many business owners tell us that. Um, Mareg mentioned in her introduction or uh, about the market that at the mall, you know, um, they were reporting that more, some were reporting more than 70% or more than 50% more um, uh, transactions. And I know that Kootenai Co-op there, basically they're crying, they're, they're having uh, people bring in 
more more stuff to restock. So, so it's, it's a huge impact, not only on, you know, in many, many ways. So basically the next slide discusses the problem. Um, and it is a problem because we've grown um, that we're just no longer sustainable as a volunteer on a volunteer run basis. And I just kind of fear that if it goes a social and economic impact to our area, you know, some people told me, well, you know, just call out for more volunteers. But when you take a look at already the number of volunteer hours and where we've grown, it, we just can't continue on that basis. I mean, they have heart and they've built it. And, um, you know, but they just don't have more hours to give. And um, I'm sorry, I find it quite emotional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of the things that happens is when I hand out the coupons and we encourage people to go spend them there so that they use them, then Jane is volunteer. I have to go count all the coupons and report them to the government, to the BC farmers market. But they also have to count them all and give them all the, reimburse them the dollars, which takes a horrendous amount of time. And when we started eight years ago, it was a simple little thing, you know, you know, you had 100, 200 coupons. Well, now we're in the thousands. I mean, it's kind of nuts, actually. It's it's a lot of work for yeah. um, volunteers. I'm still prepared to do what I do, but I just know how much work is put on to the system. Yeah. You know, this market has a huge impact on hundreds of people's livelihoods and food security and sustainability for our area. And I would just love to see it continue to continue to grow and because it should be noted that the farmers market provides many social and economic benefits to our community but you know a farmers market is not a business you know it's a not for profit and it should be considered as, as such you know we celebrate when a vendor leaves us and is able to go on their own and start a store they no longer need the market so because it's a low entry cost is for them to explore, for them to benefit. And so it's not a business. We basically are building businesses. We're building our community. And um, I hope that, you know, at the end of this, that you can see that. So we do have a solution on the next slide. And basically it's a paid year round market manager and to streamline much of the work through digital and IT technologies. And so basically it details what a market manager will uh, be able to do and what time savings uh, digital and IT technologies will accomplish. So the next slide is, um, this is where we ask for your help. Um, $90,000 will be needed to implement and cover the costs of a market manager, insurance, software, et cetera. We were asked for 30,000 per year for the next two years, and the balance will come from market revenues and grants. Uh, we do, ex we, and you know what, one of the things is I come from a business background, so I understand that, you know, you don't, you want to see this be reduced. And um, so we do have a plan to increase market revenues and reduce the impact on the municipal and grant input. And I have approached um, East End Services and I don't know what will come of that. We did, I did a presentation. I don't know, you know, where their mind is with that. And I don't, it'll probably take a little bit of time before I hear back. So anyways, I think that, you know, revenues can be increased with, you know, winter markets, which I think we're ready for. Um, you know, all sorts of fee increases slightly, though, um, and a few other things, membership, uh, sponsorship, etc. So anyways, that's it. That's kind of my last slide is coming up, where I thank you very, all very much. <laughs> <laughs> and that ends the kind of the presentation. You know, I think the social and economic impact, I hope that I was able to, to, um, you know, to express it and, you know, to understand that we're, that, you know, that the provincial, why the provincial government has designated 
um, farmers markets as an essential service. So the next few slides are in your package. There's no sense, I, I won't go over them here, but basically it's just um, testimonials from some of the farm vendors, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, you guys, for um, Gina? Through Chair, I have a lot of questions. Okay. Um, on the slide with the regional municipalities at 30,000, is there a breakdown for that, taking into account all the different municipalities in this area? Or is it just sort of a, a shoot for 30,000? I didn't do a breakdown. Amongst all of us. I didn't do a breakdown. You know, the market, we do have a market now. That was the other thing. They started a market in Fruitvale to provide another venue for our vendors um, that already is, you know, like taken off. I think there is uh, like over 40 vendors and seven of them being brand new. So most of them from our market needed another venue. So, and yeah. And there's one in Rosalind. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a market in Rosalind too. Yes, there's a market. But that's not our, no, it's not ours. Here. There's a market no. in Rosalind and uh, they also belong to the coupon program. Okay. And so does Fruitvale. So is the 30,000 just we're hoping to put it yeah. together? Yeah. yeah. Well, Rosslyn, um, we've approached Rosslyn, but Rosslyn is, you know, still on their own. So basically it's Trails Incredible Farmers Market really is a regional market. Okay. I got you. Thank you. And yes, it, like it is sort of one ask for 30,000 to the region at large, not just the city of Trail. Um, so Gina thinks about 30,000 can come from market revenues, 30,000 hopefully from local government sources, however that shakes out. And then um, she's already approached at CBC, the grant funding agency, and they've expressed some interest provided that the other funding sources can come together mm -hmm. to help with the remaining 30,000. Thank okay. you. So, oh, sorry. Just to build on the question then. The ask is for 30 from trail. Have you have you put in an ask to fulfill yet? Recognizing that they're one of them. No, I didn't. Um, so I the, haven't. the ask for 30,000 is for the, the region, for the lower Columbia, right? So not specifically 30,000 from the city of trails. Right. Well, again, so that's a bit confusing because oh, I know it's yeah, okay. Right. Because what was my question? They've already kind of got it. Was the the funding that you requested when you were with Eastside Services? How much was that? So I asked for exactly this oh. thirty thousand okay. dollars, and I don't know if we'll get it. I nope. just wanted to be upfront so nope. that you know. Okay. I think I, I think that's the confusing part is you got yeah. thirty thousand on that because remember that we're part of Eastside. Yeah. So we would be paying forty five yeah. or forty three percent of that. Okay. So we're only paying. You know, if we're in with that group, if the group commits yeah. for that, we're paying so that. The grant for thirty is would be so again. You, you, I think we probably have to review that. We almost have to wait to see what happened with Eastside Series oh, before yes. I think council would want to yes. commit yeah. to doing yeah. that grant and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, so that's the again. I'm just that's great. We're just trying to figure out that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I wanted to be honest so, and so transparent so that you know that we did approach Eastside Services. Yeah. And a hope, but I don't know what will happen there. And it might be a while before we hear. And I just wanted you to know that if we don't get funding there, then I'm begging. Yes, go ahead. Well, I could. I don't know how much, you know, I could, but it would be their percentage would be. Just how many, how many, are, are they having a monthly market out there? Or? No, they have bi weekly. Bi -weekly. Same as, so they're having the same service yeah. as we are, but not there. But much, much smaller. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I, yeah. Yeah. So I have two questions if I can. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's excellent. In the market, we saw that announcing an explosion on, on the coupons, right? It's such, a, it's such a great feature, and we don't want to lose that for sure. The one question I have was the if I'm correct in my math, if it's 188 vendors, then get a 30,000 is an increase of per vendor of $160 for how many weeks that they would attend, right? So that is not really too much to ask, I would think. So 188 rotating vendors. So we don't have 188 vendors per market. Right. That's yeah, from the vendors. Yeah, right. No, so but so 188 their vendors. So how many vendors are there every week? Approximately 50. Okay. Yeah. And partly partly with that is, you know, like you know, profit one, so right. 
So bit about 50, about 50 vendors on yeah. average, yeah. Yeah. And um, and again, have you into your budget plan? Have you had a, any increase to this year's fees? Yeah, we're increasing it uh, by five dollars. Yeah. Um, I've talked to the vendors, and you know, for them, their prices have gone up too, and so they're like. And we're competitive with the other markets. Actually, most of the other markets, some of the other markets are lower, like Castle Bar is, I think last year they were at $15 or whatever, but I think they get their support from the city. And the village of Fruit uh, Selma is also lower, but I think they also get their support there. So, so there's an increase from five to like, so that was 25 be, to $30. So, we're so, going so, to increase it by. So 25 to 30. Yeah. And um, that gets you access as the, for that day's market kind of thing. That's the one you pay that amount for your yeah. day at the market. Yeah. Yeah. And so, again, I also noticed that more you had spoken about uh, there's already funding that we're providing through the LCC DTS. It's also going to the yeah. commerce market. Let, let, let me just uh, yeah. sit, sit <laughs> talking money now. <laughs> so what Gina's looking for um, for this position is about ninety thousand dollars, right? So that would pay the salary, the mercs, and all of the pieces right. that could go with that position. But that's not the only money that the farmers market needs. They obviously, they obviously also need operating money, as we mm -hmm. as we all do to um, build that. So there's there's a you know there's a, a range of different things going on. So the market, the, the, the money that the committee, the Sustainable Agriculture Committee get, which doesn't go directly to the market exclusively because the Sustainable Agriculture Committee, which is also GINA, also does a range of, of work of which the market is one piece of it, right? So they get a small portion of this 6% of the money that goes into, that comes to the um, LCC DTS. Mm -hmm. Then goes to the committee, which is then spent between the market and other other activities that they do. Yeah, yeah it's, speaking to the financial guy. So um, on that side of it too, uh, that's I understand that part. Yeah. Now, when you look out at the percentage of the farmers or artisans that are coming into the market, is there any way to know? I um, mean, because I think you probably have some farmland out in either way, but I don't know how many of the farmers would be trail farmers, or are we talking again, Montrose, Fruitvale, outside of the community, Creston, and things like that? That again, yeah. Um, so most of our farmers are in the area A and Boundary, most of them. And is there any, I mean, I, I kind of get it, but and some and some in the city because they have small sure no no i, I get that but mostly their area a and the boundary i mean it's just i think it's a problem like i said we know it's a great generator for here but it's also one of those questions i think it's great that you've gone to east side seven but it also sounds like maybe uh you know grant works or whatever area farmers we need to help you know help fund some of these things so they've got a place for them to bring their wares to it's just one of those questions again where you come to the trail taxpayer you know again as a group to help fund something that's supporting something in other areas and again those are just one of those, those are just questions that I think anyone needs when they come to the table here and ask for money and it's a regional thing, they just need to be able to answer. It's not trying to be picky on it. But. I'd like to add that it's not the farmers are out, so most of them are outside the area, but the people that bring the wares from their home are mostly trail yeah. people. Yeah. The people that bring their trinkets sure. and their baking mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. type of stuff, they're mostly the trail people or Warfield or you know, they're certainly the people that are local. Yeah. Roslyn, yeah. And that's great, Marilyn. But that's the sort of thing, too. Yeah. When you're coming presenting, it's important to kind of say if we've got out of the 50 vendors, if 40 of them are farmers, that, you know, of that 40, 30 are coming from the boundary and 10 are from, uh, that's just good information for, for council. Well, and, good for me to know because I'm not, I'm new at this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, exactly, right? <laughs> so it's, thank it's, you. Yes, yes. But it's that, 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 you know, if artisans, if they're 10 or 15, that they're all from trail, these would be great things for, yeah. for us mm -hmm. to know. And the other side of it is that, I appreciate um, you know where you're at, but uh, a full-time farmers market uh, for 12 months at 90k. I know that's wage plus benefits. I just wonder. It's, it's is, 90k including benefits. No, no, it's what I mean. I'm about yeah. just saying to you that whole concept. Mm -hmm. 
is there a need for a full-time person is, you know, that's, those are some of those questions, like whether or not you go a bit smaller and kind of even see if you've got a farmer's market that, that does the farmer's market this year, that maybe isn't yeah, uh, a 90 K. Yeah. So uh, there are, there are a couple of ways of going at, at that uh, question, um, Colin. Um, so as somebody who works with Gina and supports Gina a lot, um, I can, I can tell you that, um, for the, for the market to grow in the way that it has grown over the last seven years has required Gina to work full-time four hours um, and their volunteer hours. Um, <coughs> and Gina works between 50 and 60 hours a week, which is, as you know, we all know around this table, this is that's that's more than a full-time job. Um, uh, Gina has indicated that um, uh, she, while she's not ready to completely retire from the market, she does actually want to do a couple of other things, which is shocking, <laughs> but also quite reasonable. Um, and so, you know, when we were when we were talking about um, what what would be required to sustain the level of activity that is, you know, that goes on into the market, and to also build out some of these other areas that Gina has been talking about, including, for example looking at um, finding a commercial kitchen that is large enough to be dedicated to um, doing doing some work in support of all of, the, all of the farmers and the market, then it is going to take a full time for a year. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, so we, we think about the market as just being the summer activity, <clears throat> but there is also the Christmas markets, which take, I don't know, three months or so to plan. The oh, East already working on it. Already working on it. What? Mm -hmm. They play February. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there's the Easter markets as well. So, yeah, yeah. and then all of the other pieces. That, so, what would, what, I guess the short way of saying this is that the thing that we thought about five years ago as being this nice little thing that we all did on the side on a Saturday is now a massive creator of jobs of economic impact and is itself becoming um, in danger of, of being its own entity, right? I mean, it's just, it's generating so much work, so much activity that is no longer can be supported by the volunteer hours that go into it, yeah. which is why a full-time, full-year person is the only way to go. Yeah. So do you see a transition from the, from the grant request to keep this full full-time position uh, sustainable? Yes. Um, when does that happen? Well, it, 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 it happens this you know this year. As so you get thirty thousand this year. Like next year, are you coming back for more thirty? I, I, you know, it it will depend. Um, Nick, you know, on on how the um, funding cycle goes. But the plan is to make sure that this person has enough invested in them and enough capacity that they can also um, write grants to support their own their own mm -hmm. position. Right. It's there is a lot of work that needs to go into this. Um, if I could just quickly add to that, I think that that's a very important point that there's sort of an initial investment in this position um, that is necessary to not only sustain the momentum, but also contribute to the long term sustainability of the position. So, I mean, yes, it's technically possible to have a part-time or like sh temporary contract market manager. But there's, um, I think, a big risk there that somebody working for only a part of the year, there'll be a big like drop in productivity as soon as that person is gone. If you have less hours, the <laughs> amount of service, amount of events, those kinds of things will go down. But on the flip side, if you have a full-time sort of permanent position for at least two years, that person can be mandated to be like, okay, so you need to be looking at year three, right? From your first day, you need to be looking at year three for how your position is going to continue to be there. And I think that that lends to reducing the load on local government for input and ramping up new and creative ways of revenue for the market, which Gina has already talked about a little bit. So, I mean, it's it's sort of how we want to proceed and how we want to sustain the market at its current 
level that I think is important in the, the full-time position. Mm -hmm. Are there other communities that have a position like this in place that um, you can you can speak on the success of? Or? Yeah, well, Kristen has a full-time market manager. Um, I don't know. I don't know Pardon? about now. Yeah, so in that sense, it's through the youth center. So they, they've got, there are overarching, we, take, we took it on a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, to have it underneath our umbrella. Yeah. And do you have, uh, I, I think, is there one or two staff that you have there? Yeah, so kind of on that, what you talked about, there's that sort of outside of the season sort of thing. So there's definitely a quiet period for them as far as things go. Uh, but their sort of senior staff is, is involved in a bunch of different entrepreneurial things. And so then they also have the, they're, they're ready in the spring to hire the staff and to kind of get them through uh, the, the, you know, the the market until the fall kind of thing and then they right. get kind of a quiet period so that's that's how they want to want to do it yeah and yeah. we're gonna try we want to be like filling a lot of those gaps because there is nothing in the winter right. so we want to lead that we want to lead that for our region for for um west kootenays <laughs> to lead that winter market um yeah. space that is that we need right now there isn't anything anywhere mm -hmm. for that really so we want to fill that gap and um, really, really grow the um, the agricultural area mm. and uh, opportunities here. So, and so just on the math part, so how many markets? So, like, and if you're thirty dollars a market, uh, you know, basically fifty vendors. I'm just trying to do the math. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a, it's a bad habit. But fifty times how many vendors times how many weeks? Kind of thing. So we've got right now. We've got. 13 uh, markets on the Esplanade. Okay. And we anticipate that will grow with when we don't have, when it's not all volunteers. Mm -hmm. And we have um, the two, we had two Christmas markets, an Easter market. We're involved okay. with spectacular music in the park too. Um, what else is there? We'll be involved with the May uh, six mm -hmm. market. Yeah. Um, so the and some of these are like big events. They're not like just going to the market. They're we have created events, and a lot of our markets, if you notice, they really have big themes around them, and um, like pride. Um, uh, we looked at the car show. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, what else is there? The indigenous sure. market. Yeah. So there's these are like they're not like our markets aren't just like a regular farmers market. These are events that bring people in, mm -hmm. and that's why we're very proud of the fact that we have forty thousand visitors, at not including spectacular music in the park. So that's just events, mostly on the Esplanade. And the money again would it flow? I mean, forgive me, I can't remember on your kind of vision. Is it going to uh, to LCDS? Is that who it would is? have to because the farmers market is only sort of its own entity. It has a separate bank account, but like the LCCDTS is the actual nonprofit society yeah. that holds the farmers market. Thank you. I do want to say, and I want to thank this councilor, Paul. Going from Cedar Avenue, the Esplanade has also been a huge, huge change. And people are very happy and it lets us grow when people are coming and going. And it that is an excellent site, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, yeah. It's beautiful down there. It brings people from all over. Yeah. Because we we actually advertise it as come on down, visit the market, and because we advertise it everywhere. You know, walk across the suspension bridge. Yeah. You know, take a look at our award-winning gardens. So we advertise trail in our in our market lane. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the market. It's yeah. basically we're selling the city of trail and the location and what they can do here. Come and see our brand new our our um, river riverfront center. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. You know, like there's lots of things here. And people are saying, oh, I haven't been downtown trail. I didn't know all this was here. Yeah. And you're going like, dumb. Yeah. You know, so basically there's lots of, and once you get them, then they start coming more and we have more people coming yeah. now. And people are returning now because before they thought they, they were going to, I don't know what they thought they were going to see. Apples. 
<laughs> yeah. You know, they're going to get poisoned and die. You know. <laughs> so it's it's fascinating that they see the beauty here as a river. I mean, we're in the only free flowing section of the Columbia River. <laughs> You know, like it's amazing, mm -hmm. and you know, like come and see this. And you know, they come down to the market, and they'll see now boats coming down there, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's beautiful parking lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's more than just the market; it's basically a trail. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say that it has been an amazing addition to our community. The farmers' markets really brought in a lot of people, and um, uh, like you say, the economic development part of it. Um, just a, a little bit concerned about the ask here, though it's a little bit confusing to me. I mean, I, I think we want to make this work as much as possible if we can. But uh, yeah, the ask is a little bit um, interesting because it's for a two-year term, right? You're asking for $30 per year for the two two years. And are you asking that from the East End 7 as well? So that's why I was telling you if I've asked the East End services for the same thing. Okay. But I don't know because I don't know if we're going to get it or not. Yeah. So I think we probably have to hold. It. We'll wait and see what happens to the East End services. They might give us all. They might get, I don't, They might give us nothing. I don't know. Uh -huh. And I'm a little bit uh, concerned about the funding as well because they won't guarantee you. The two years in a row, will they? At CBC might. Yeah. I've um, worked with them in the past and mm -hmm. they can be remarkably flexible, um, but we will have to have a few talks with them to see what they're willing to do. So it is all quite up in the air right now, okay. for sure. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like we're exploring the funding options at this mm -hmm. stage. And, and timing on that, um, right. because I know that um, RDKB, if they are going to agree to that, their budget is ahead of when the city has to present their sort of thing. So, so they will have to make a decision sooner. Like in the next uh, number of weeks, they'll have to make a decision on that. Uh, and so, on your timing, when is sort of the you know need to know kind of thing? Well, I was hoping that we would know. Probably, I was hoping April, but I don't know how fast East End Services works. Well, and again, if they're going to, they're going to have to have an answer to that sooner than when. So. We, would, we would love to be able to be recruiting this mm -hmm. position in April, May sure. this year, yeah. okay. um, just so that we have someone that is on deck early enough in the season that they can be working mm -hmm. with Gina to yeah. help make the markets um, season successful mm -hmm. and then can start doing the planning for the yeah. and the spring next year yeah we need that transition mm -hmm. period and i'm willing to basically give all my time because i don't want to see it collapse and um you know basically when this market started it was you know they, all volunteers like i said but i also used my staff yeah. to start this market at, you know with no yeah. no um you know didn't put anything into it it was you know my staff time and uh, my time and my husband's time. Yeah. <laughs> um, would it be helpful for council if we kind of wrote just a little summary for you that could follow up this conversation and presentation just around like the funding ask and some of the questions that have been asked today? Would that be useful to you? I, I think it really would be. Okay. You know, and just Great. even some of that breakdown as well. And again, sure. it would also, I think, be important for these side services to know that breakdown of. You know, yeah, this is going on here, yeah. but we're also helping areas outside of, mm -hmm. of um, not just trail. I mean, again, we, we know that there's a benefit economic for being in our community, but mm -hmm. it's also just, I think, sometimes a nudge or like, well, why would I, you know, in area, why would I do that? It's like, hey, wait a second, you've got 30% uh, of the farmers. So that, that kind of information would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's hard to break down because when you think about other markets, their farmers aren't coming from their city either. <laughs> no, no, but it, but again, that's where we, uh, in my experience, has been is to lean on those other areas that have the farmers mark, you know, farmers that they're helping out, mm -hmm. say help us out. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not always successful, but it's one of those good yeah. things that allows a uh, trail counselor to be able yeah. to say yes, we asked area A, and yes, we asked these other areas. If that if they don't come to the table, that those are the questions that sometimes uh, counselors need to be able to ask, it's like or answer, I should say, it's like, well, why are you guys doing this? It's like, well. We wanted to make it work. We asked, you know, if we don't get success there. And I think it also, um, it allows those groups to know how valuable it is for their community members that they're representing. 
Because, mm -hmm. sorry, when you think about it, though, most of the, um, there's a lot of meat uh, farmers that come from the boundary area, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a great presentation. Like, you guys did an awesome job here. It's just the funding part that's a little bit confusing. But if you present it to them, excuse me, I'm like, I'm sure they would be, I mean, why wouldn't they be interested in supporting it as well? You know, it is for their uh, market, their farmers. The regional district, you mean? Or? Well, no, if you were going to take it over to um, Grand Forks, over into that area, to the uh, municipalities over there. Oh, yeah. doesn't Meemaw's, yeah, Meemaw's, Meemaw's yes. needs comes from Grand Forks? Yeah, that so would be like asking, I don't know, like, I don't know if they support their markets because Grand Forks has a weekly yeah. market but as the, well. Supporting the farmers yeah. from their area is maybe how Yeah, most of the it. farmers would come from the boundary. They wouldn't mm -hmm. be coming from the city, right? Yeah. Well, as same as like Nelson. Is there any farmers in Nelson? Probably not. Well, downtown, downtown, downtown. 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 We don't do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry. sorry. Just a sec, Mike's. I, I know that this is um, an incredibly stressful and complicated and difficult time um, for, for funding. I know that there are lots of asks that come your way. I would just ask, you know, and I'm going to be coming back here two weeks from now on a completely <laughs> different issue. Um, but I, I would just ask you to think about the impact that the market has had, not just mm -hmm. the social, the, the economic, the direct economic impact that this has had on the community. Yeah. It's not just supporting farmers from everywhere else. It's, you know, it brings people in that spend money in other parts of the town as well. But I, I also, um, you know, I, I know that Gina has also been working incredibly hard and is kind of at the end of her mm -hmm. of the period. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to be really careful that we don't we don't burn out our volunteers and and risk losing this incredible resource. Mm -hmm. in town. Yeah. It's all I'm saying. No, I agree. Thank you. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Just out of curiosity, I was just reading your news release with the Skill Center. Very exciting. Uh, is there a way two weeks from is, now? We'll <laughs> to hear you about that. Is there a way to work with the potential community kitchen that you guys are going to have? With so them? I knew that you were going to. Am ask I that getting question. ahead of myself? You are a little bit. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so I just, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we, if, you know, not surprisingly, we've been talking about uh, that. Just <laughs> um, but the the issue is that the community, the the kitchen, the commercial kitchen that the farmers need. Um, they, they actually need intense oh, um, access to that, almost, probably almost full time. And the commercial kitchen that we're putting into the new building at the skill center is actually focused on building community programs. So it's, you know, it's just, it's a different yeah. end. Okay, of, I was of just that. curious. So, yeah, so we, you know, we were brainstorming a couple of weeks ago about where there could be other sites yeah. where a commercial kitchen could be installed. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's a, that's a quarter of a million dollar ask. For sure. Yeah, so Councilor yeah. Hanson, did you, or, did you have any questions? No, thanks. Hi, guys. Sorry, I am here. Sorry, I'm just away at a work conference right now. Um, no, I, I, you know what, I think it's great. A lot of the questions were answered. You know, I think waiting to see where things end up with the East End 7 first to see, and then, of course, a breakdown, um, you know, as a regional um, service. You know, even though it is provided in trail, I think we really need to, you know, work that we're, you know, supporting all of those facets, um, you know, the farmers, the artisans, the community as a whole. And I think it would be definitely beneficial if we have all of our, um, you know, our regional kind of support from uh, those other areas as well that don't particularly have, um, you know, a market. Also, ben. So just, I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. I've been to the markets a lot, uh, but I did it, the coupon program. I, I did not know about. Um, I think it's really important that the community knows um, what what you're doing to support those that need help. And I like how you you um, discuss the the vendors that go there. It's like they're low risk. It's their jumping off point. It's like their goal to like not go to the market because they're going to have a Starbucks. I really appreciated your explanation. It was a great presentation. Well, the visitors are bringing the trail. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a, 
powerful number. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Yeah. yeah. And I think adding on to the other events and making them, you know, yeah. and just creating another yeah. dimension to, to already success. Oh, uh, it, absolutely. Yeah. It just changes the whole environment that yeah. the functions, yeah. you know, like music in the park. What would it be like without the farmer's market there? Yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. great. You guys are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's very evident. <clears throat> thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank thank you. you. I'll see you all in a couple of weeks. You're not going to buy it anymore. Okay. 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 Oh, oh, oh. Bye. Bye, dear. Have a good time. Go <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I have to scoot. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Appreciate you guys. Yes, thank you, Dina. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is a grant and aid um, for the LCCDTS, the Sustainable Agriculture Committee, a request for cash grant. Pardon yes. me. Oh, where did everybody go? The general <laughs> We don't have quorum. Did we lose Tia? Yeah, Tia. Point two, yeah. The expense allowance memo. Yeah. Oh, sorry, guys. Sorry. I was so involved in that <laughs> farmer's market. Yes. Item number 2.1 is the council policy GG 005.2, uh, dot to the expense allowance. And um, the recommendation is before you. Any questions or comments on the recommendation? Yes, Here we go. Um, just curious, why is this being brought towards kind of internet? Why is there feelings of misuse uh, uh, under previous? Not, um, I think that it, one of the first things that came here, it's one of the things I noticed, was, um, and that had seemed historically, that I knew that people had attended meetings that would have had um, meals included. So that's one reason. And so there was uh, a sense um, from uh, that that didn't matter, that you just applied and, and you just got your cookie and even if there was, now not, not everyone did that, but that, that was certainly mm -hmm. was the policy, right? So sort of, again, you can go in this world, the policy is I get this amount per per diem, even if the registration that you have uh, includes meals, which again, I think for any of us, it's uh, the best way I think to be, don't want to be on the front page of the Toronto Times with, you know, whatever goes away and uh, your meals have been provided and you've kind of double dipped, right? So that's 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 not one thing. But I think a lot of it too is just some cleanup. There's some wording, there's some, uh, this is just best practices when we looked around the region. And I think that if anyone looks at this, it really isn't much that you can say it makes sense. It makes a clarity, I think, clearer for, for staff and for council as to how it would work and how you apply for it. And so yeah, I, I so think it's disappointed to hear you say that you felt there were counselors in the previous term who would misuse this because I felt that was going on too. Yeah, so I, and I was speaking to the Trail Times. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be terrible to have people's face on the front of the Trail Times. So um, disappointing that we're having to bring this conversation up, especially when we have much more important business like budgets, shelters to deal with. Yeah. And the other question I have for you is at the end, you have a point where it has to be in with three days. Is that business days or is that um, days including a weekend? Yeah, I, I, would, I would. It would definitely be a business day. Okay, so, and, and that is, it gets, is there a timeline for when we can be? Well, when we would see our reimbursement coming through. And I'm not putting you on the spot yeah. here, but I was submitted a, a, a just October 27th, yeah. and I still not received reimbursement. Well, uh, those should have gone through because one of the things that they've been doing. So people, if they don't check, uh, they are going through your payroll. So no, no, I have checked. Oh. Okay, well, that's certainly something I could yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no. And I know, uh, I understand it's probably a staffing issue, but yeah. I'd like to see some language in there around when um, council uh, uh, or a person who's putting their expense in can ex reasonably expect to have the uh, uh, reimbursement yeah. done through payroll because it seems a little offside. Of it. And then also just to clarify the three business days, okay. because I was unaware or I knew the three business days were there. Because two of those days have been a Saturday and a Sunday. Sure. I thought my my um, request had been um, not approved. Yeah. No, no. Yep. These are great questions. Um, and um, 
the uh, like I said, we will certainly check on that. How we do here is a bit differently, and especially if it was for council, which it, which is a great point, uh, council builder, because you guys only get paid once a month, so a bit different than usually if you've got yes. employees that are kind of on that uh, double, uh, you know, every couple of weeks. It's not yeah. so much of a hard hardship, but if you went to something and submitted something that uh, was in one part and didn't get paid till the next month, I can see that. So certainly something we can check on and 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 adjust. So. Would it be fair enough to perhaps ask this council for, uh, for, for a staff report on where funds previously might you feel might have been misused? Or uh, well, and I, and I, I don't, we're gonna, I would be careful to say uh, misused because the policy was, was such that you were allowed to claim. So there was no, mm -hmm. I have no way of going back per se and checking and, and doing that. And again, don't all just think that this was a, a council sort of situation, right? This is, you've got a, this wasn't a, a policy. Yeah. One thing I will say is that very, very little travel over the last couple of years. Again, another reason, I think part of the reason we were bringing forward is to get ready for what's coming forward because we do see a lot of travel, not only for, um, uh, council, uh, but also for staff to be you know, kind of see that opening up of, of conferences mm -hmm. and things like that that have basically been shut down for most cases for about three years. So I would say, if anything, that uh, it's been pretty light or pretty quiet of any travel at all. So you should, you know, yourselves, council, community should feel comfortable that uh, very little opportunity to even um, make a claim here in the last number of years. So again, part of it for me is just there's, there's a, there are a lot of your policies that are way behind on best practices mm -hmm. and so it's it is in itself could be a contract to have us look at uh, policies bylaws and things like that uh, mm -hmm. to be able to get us up into the best practice place which we want to be and, and again to a you can only kind of deal with so much and, and, and i appreciate that and i understand that so i just want to but i just uh it is obviously a a, a difficult point for me because mm -hmm. I, I do feel because it is public knowledge of expensive claims paid to counselors and I always felt um surprised when I would see others coming through at higher much higher amounts especially when I had attended uh conferences and uh knew what was being provided for us so I'm glad to see that you put some clarity into it and um and I hope that this council can definitely uh adhere to the uh, rules put forward so on that side, um, maybe just if we could defer the decision on this and we'll just make those small tweaks just because I'd like it to be as smooth as possible. We'll bring it back for next year. Councillor Benson had a question. Oh, sorry. I, I really like how um, this is one area that I, I run into at, at work sometimes mm -hmm. that you've you've separated like kind of the municipal business within versus like the, mm -hmm. in Vancouver. Um, mm -hmm. It's I like that you've done that. Yeah. No, that's what wasn't necessarily me. I like that staff did that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> should, should urban center be defined for the popular like also, or are we just <clears throat> yeah. was there a question there? That's Tia. Tia? So that's a shop. Oh, shop. No, that's her. Um oh, well, I think in most cases it, it's uh, for the most part, I think uh, when I look at it. Uh, we could look at it a bit more of a definition on that. I can certainly look into a, a definition of urban. I mean, whether or not that's low mainland. I mean, again, I don't mm -hmm. know if you would say we kind of said interior BC. I guess you could have someone going to Terrace or, or you know, Prince George and that sort of thing. We can, we can certainly see that. Uh, well, also, so. if, I mean, if there were to be other travel outside the province to our yeah, we did talk about um, on the on the outside of the province being at that, mm -hmm. that higher rate, but it's fair. I mean, I think part of it was just to recognize that certain places where you know it's more yeah. what we kind of see locally. Yeah, so, I was I was glad to see an update actually, because <laughs> you know things have changed a lot in uh, eight years for sure. Uh, but we don't have a a number for the mileage is it just it's going to be it's revenue yeah. Canada. so oh, okay. it really based on yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Canada's revenue there's no it, they just give you the number okay. we just take that number whatever that number is and so we don't have to make yeah. any adjustments each year because otherwise we bring it back and saying oh okay. you know this okay. amount of that amount okay and so, you also know that a whole floor of actuarials have gone through what uh, it costs for a vehicle for the mileage so there's no mm -hmm. Okay, so if, no, 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 no. yeah, just on a, on on the, on the topic of expenses and conferences, um, Sandy had referenced in an earlier email that she, we would be voting on individuals who would be 
that would be brought forth to council before bookings are made. And it's my understanding that the LGLA is already well underway and that hasn't been presented to council. I think that there was an overall um, goal here for me to have been and get further into budget anyway, but I think part of it was trying to map out what your budget would be for 2023 for all the different, um, because we had kind of got some feedback on who wanted to go where, and I think that that's going to come and kind of find out as we place in where the numbers are. So I would say that um, usually the LGAO one is usually one that's not, uh, you know, it's usually everyone's available to vote kind of thing if they want to attend. The LGLA? No, uh, sorry, the MKBLG, is that the one that you're talking about? I'm just about the LGLA. Yeah. So again, I, I don't know if, I, if that's part of our overall budget, we'll just have to make sure where we're at right now that we'll just her, her note from the 1st of October says that all costs will need to be advanced to council for approval. Uh, yeah, well, and again, I'm just assuming that when we put the budget together here, because we've got a spreadsheet that kind of shows the estimated cost for FCM, UBCM, AKBLG, those sorts of things. And I think as a package, we would uh, kind of see who's going and be able to vote on. So you're confident that we're, we'll be able to. Oh, yes. So I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it maybe have to be a bit higher. I'm certainly knowing that travel is not um, less, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's more. So those are some of the things that we'll have to take a look at. We've got a, a, kind of a budget in there to, to be able to uh, present, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I don't know. My goal, I'm working on it. I'm a little <laughs> bit snow right now. No, and I, I get the part on. Okay. So uh, if there's no other questions or comments, I guess we'll call for the question. All those in favor of the question? Well, I think that we were just talking about deferring it. So oh. we just, oh, we'll sorry. just defer this and we'll bring it back to next year. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. You know, I appreciate that uh, feedback. Uh, okay. Yeah. So does that need to be a motion? Um, motion to defer. I think you can yes. do that. So. Yeah. So I'll I make that motion. Okay. Second. Thank you, Councillor Benson and Councillor Martin. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Okay. No, I think that's the same answer for the next one here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, just to bring it Mayor back. Jones, <laughs> Mayor Jones, before you move on, can I just note if it's possible for you to readjust the view of the owl. What we're seeing is just the rear of the room right now. Oh, okay. That's probably that one. It's missing there. I didn't want to interrupt the discussion prior. I can, if you continue to turn that around. Which is it turning for you right now? Uh, now I have no. There we go. Oh, yeah, me. I took the light. <laughs> no, the lights are on here. Oh. There's the eyes. Okay. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And this screen for us black, too, but well, I, yeah, I she's unknown. So we're getting. Councilor Butler, if you could continue to spin that, the one that you had, <laughs> I think it would help. That's the one there you go. There we go. There you go. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Corporate officer, the guys are getting. Okay. All right. I'm trying to have my agenda at the same time. So, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Next uh, agenda. Item number three the grants and aid to uh, sponsorships 3.1, the LCC DTS Sustainable Agriculture Committee request for cash. Well, I guess just a motion to refer that back to staff. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll yeah. wait to find out what's happened with um, the earlier request. Oh. And I would also make sorry, just a question. Oh, yes. so uh, the regional district, uh, East End, they haven't made any decision on this because of the uh, the timing of the request mm -hmm. through the budget cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at right now. Yeah. I just wanted to say that to them. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. But they did receive it, as yes. you're saying. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Okay, so we have a motion to defer the recommendation. All those in favor? Yes. Do we want to put a date on it? I think we just want to leave it open, probably, because okay. uh, I think that if by the time March ends here, the thing that would be early April would be the latest we would want to, you know, kind of, because by then we would know what's happening, I think, with the RDKD budget. So is it unfair if we could say April, April 30th? I just would leave it open, I guess. Okay. I just... Fair enough. 
Okay, thank you. So all those in favor of the motion to defer the um, grant and aid? Carried unanimously. Thank you. I'm just gonna leave that open then, okay. Okay, next on the agenda is adjournment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll make that motion. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm.